Great. Thanks to you guys for having me. So today I'm going to talk about siderophores and their role in the cycling of iron. And I'm really interested in trace metals in general because metals are involved in many key cellular processes taken out by phytoplankton. So this is a picture of a single phytoplankton cell. And if we think about what this cell needs in order to grow, it needs several different types of metals from seawater, such as iron for different transport proteins, nickel, copper, vitamin B12 has cobalt as an important metal cofactor. And so we're interested in understanding the distributions of these metals and how cells can access them in order to grow at an optimal rate. But it's kind of complicated in seawater, and we call them trace metals because they're generally very scarce. And this is a graph here that shows the cellular ratio of a given element um, that's required for phytoplankton growth on average in the ocean. And then on this axis here is the concentration of that element in seawater. And so anything that's kind of following to the right of this plot is relatively depleted in seawater. Anything to the left is enriched in seawater relative to what phytoplankton need to grow. And anything that falls on this darker gray bar is 10 times or 100 times either enriched or depleted, relatively speaking. And then the colors are the residence time of that element. So if you notice over here, we have some of the major cations in seawater. They're obviously very enriched. But if we look at where the trace metals fall, so for example, copper here, has some pretty big error bars, but it seems it's relatively enriched in seawater relative to its requirements for phytoplankton growth. And cobalt is one of these ones that's generally very depleted, even 100 times less um, depleted in seawater compared to what phytoplankton need to grow. And so specifically, I'm going to talk about iron, which probably a lot of us are maybe familiar with. But again, it's one of these metals here that is very depleted in seawater relative to what's necessary for phytoplankton growth. And so because of this, it's been recognized that iron is often limiting for growth in many areas of the ocean. So this map is a surface map of nitrate concentrations where the green colors are higher concentrations of nitrate and blue are lower. And anywhere where you see a colored dot is where an individual incubation experiment has been done. And the color of that dot represents which nutrient was limiting to phytoplankton growth in that experiment. So some of the dots have multiple colors, and that means there was also secondary nutrient limitation. You can see there's a lot of red dots here, and those are all the experiments where iron was found to be limiting. And most of these experiments are in these areas of high nitrate, so the HNLC regions. And because it's been recognized now for a long time that iron is so important for phytoplankton growth and thus primary productivity, and therefore the drawdown of CO2 from the atmosphere, then there's this famous quote from the late John Martin that says, if you give me half a tanker of iron, I will give you an ice age. And that's just you know, showing the really important connection that we know there is between iron and primary productivity, and that's the drawdown of CO2 on these long time scales. But iron chemistry in seawater is a little bit complicated. Um, it's generally very scarce in seawater because it doesn't have a good solubility. So, if you think of just inorganic forms of iron, its solubility is very low. And so if we look at this profile of dissolved iron, it's in nanomole concentrations, generally in seawater. And if it was only inorganic forms of iron in seawater, the profile would look a bit more just kind of like this red line. So it'd be much lower than what we actually observe. And so because we observe these higher concentrations of iron than would be assumed just from inorganic speciation, we know that it's because iron, dissolved iron in seawater is generally complex by organic molecules or organic ligands. And these ligands enhance the solubility of iron in seawater. And so I'm gonna talk a lot about ligands today, specifically siderophores, which are a type of ligand that I'll explain. But a ligand is just an organic molecule that binds iron. And so these ligands are um, in generally much higher concentrations than um, dissolved iron in seawater and they're kind of what's enhancing its solubility. And in fact, to understand dissolved iron cycling, we have to understand what's going on with these organic ligands. And so this here on the top is a map of the Atlantic Ocean that's kind of squished, but where all these little X's are 
our stations where we took dissolved iron measurements on a geotraces program cruise. And those dissolved iron measurements are represented in this figure here where the top 500 meters are represented in this top panel and then 1,000 to about 5,000 meters in the bottom. Concentrations are in the colors. So this is a map of the observations that were measured in seawater of dissolved iron. And if we try to model these dissolved iron concentrations that we actually measured, and we don't include organic ligands in the model, this is the model output. So you can see that the colors look a little bit different than they do up here. So we're not able to model these dissolved iron concentrations very effectively if we don't include ligands. But if we look at an example of a model output that does include dynamic cycling of organic ligands, we can see that this matches the observations much better. So I think this is a really good example that to understand iron, we actually need to understand a lot about these organic compounds. And in fact, in one particular modeling study, it was shown that in the model, the concentration of dissolved iron binding ligands has more of an effect on the atmospheric CO2 in the model because of the connection between iron and primary productivity than actually changing the iron inputs in the model, such as from dust or hydrothermal effects. So this is just another good example of why we need to understand what these compounds are. And so in our current conceptualization of the model of the iron cycle, if we kind of zero in on some of the parameters that are represented here, we see that in general, some of our most successful biogeochemical models that incorporate iron cycling have excess ligand production in surface waters, as well as some scavenging of iron that's set by this variable ligand concentration. And so it's been recognized that we need to understand these compounds. So this is a map now of all the global ligand measurements that we have to date. And you can see that there's definitely a lot of room for improvement, but we're getting a lot better with some of these large programs like Geotraces, which are mostly Kristen's data <laughs> um, here and some other places. And when I show this map and I say we have measurements of ligands, what I'm referring to are these types of measurements that are called voltammetry or sometimes electrochemistry is what you'll hear them referred to. And these measurements, we just determine the concentration and the strength of these organic compounds. And they're generally represented by these classes of ligands based on their binding strength. So L1 through however many classes. And we generally see three classes or so, or in many cases, just one or two, depending on the analytical methods. But in these methods, we don't know what the compounds are. Um, so, if we look at kind of what, in general, these, the profiles of these ligands look like from all these measurements, on the left here we have a depth bin sort of average profile of dissolved iron. And again, you can see it's nanomolar concentrations. And then same for the ligands here. So we have L1 in blue. So this is the strongest ligand class, so the most tightly bound to iron. And then L2 is in this kind of orange color here. And so one of the things that's really striking from this profile is that this strongest ligand class and also this kind of little bit weaker L2 class, we see them in almost all depths in many of these um, samples, down to 6,000 meters even. And there's some subtleties between basins. Um, but we found this to be really interesting with this growing data set of ligands because most of our work on understanding these compounds has been focused on L1, which is the most tightly bound to iron. And we're interested because they seem to really be what's controlling some of these dissolved iron distributions. And so obviously we want to know what are these L1 ligands. Um, so we've thought for a long time that perhaps these L1 ligands are siderophores. And siderophores are iron binding ligands that are produced by microbes to help in the uptake of iron. And we know about them very well from the terrestrial world because soil bacteria produce these compounds in order to remobilize particulate iron in the soil. And so we think that this L1 pool is at least comprised in some part of these compounds because in several studies now, the strengths of siderophores that have been isolated from marine cultures have similar strengths as the L1 ligands we see in seawater. We have seen the production of L1 ligands in experimental work, as, um, especially under iron limiting conditions. And then there have been a few studies that have attempted to measure siderophores so far in seawater, just not that many, but we have seen them in some surface water samples. 
So all these lines of evidence, as well as some other evidence, suggest that siderophores are at least some portion of this L1 ligand pool. So what I'm interested in, because I come from a background of voltammetry, that Kristen mentioned she taught me how to do these measurements when I was an undergrad. And so I've been really interested if siderophores really are comprising this ligand pool, especially since they go down to 6,000 meters in the ocean. I think that's very intriguing. And so I really want to know if we can see them below the euphotic zone and just kind of why they're there and what's going on. And so in general, I'm interested in what's their role in binding iron. Are they being, is the iron associated with them being taken up by organisms? And how are they contributing overall to iron cycling? So the methods that I'm using for isolating these siderophores in seawater are called solid phase extraction methods. So in general, we're trying to isolate organic matter in kind of, we think, the nanomolar, picomolar concentration amongst this background organic matter pool of micromolar concentration. So we take these columns and we pump seawater through the columns in order to pre-concentrate and simplify our organic matrix. And then when we analyze the samples, we separate them out using liquid chromatography. And we do two different mass spectrometry steps connected to the same liquid chromatography. So first, we couple this to ICPMS. And for this step, we're at determining the retention times as well as quantifying the iron-containing ligands. Or we also do other metals at the same time. But I'm just going to focus on iron today. And then we do a second step where we use the same chromatography to identify then the masses of these compounds at the retention times that we've already determined. So just as an example, I'm going to show you that what this first step kind of looks like. So I'll be showing a lot of these. And this is a chromatogram of what we're reading on the ICPMS. So we have iron counts here on the Y, and then retention time here on the x-axis. So anywhere that you see a peak, that's where a discrete iron-containing compound came off our column and went into the ICPMS. So that represents, in this case, a siderophore for this talk. So wherever you see one of these little peaks, that's where a siderophore is coming off. And then for this second step, we then take at that certain retention time where we're interested in a compound that has come off, we then look at all of the masses that have come off on that same retention time. And it can be thousands, so it could look something like this. But we are interested in finding our one mass that contains iron and is our siderophore of interest. So the way that we mine through that is we look through all of these masses, and we look for this correct iron isotope ratio within that compound, as well as the correct change of intensity for the compound containing both those isotopes. So that's kind of how we search for this needle in the haystack of all these, these masses. So it really helps us to have the first step where we have at least narrowed down the retention times that we want to look. So OK, I'm going to just focus on this first kind of broad question here. And so my study area is in the North Pacific. So I'm looking at siderophore distributions from Station Aloha down here by Hawaii up into kind of a subpolar HNLC type region. And we're looking in this area because there's a nice natural gradient in iron as well as macronutrient concentrations. And then at Station Aloha, at least, there's some historical iron and ligand data that we can also compare to. So this is some historical data from Station Aloha. And the interesting thing from some of this data, we have ligand concentrations over several days on the top and then dissolved iron over several days on the bottom. And this is just so there's actually some daily variability in ligand concentrations as well as iron, even at Station Aloha, which we don't think is being super dynamic with respect to iron. But there are a lot of interesting patterns. And then if you look at depth profiles of iron and ligands over several seasons, there's also a little bit of variability that we can see within the profile. So that suggests to me that if siderophores are, in fact, comprising some portion of this pool, perhaps there's going to be some interesting things to see there. So first, I just looked at some surface waters in different seasons. And so again, these are the plots from the ICPMS, where anywhere you see a little peak is a siderophore. And so the different colors are just some different samples from different seasons. And you can see that there is some seasonality in the presence of these siderophore compounds. And that was kind of interesting to us because we don't think of Station Aloha as being an iron limited system in general. And that's one of the reasons that we think these compounds are being produced. So already we thought that was pretty interesting. 
And then we're interested, as I mentioned, just to look at any depth profiles of sideriformes because we have none to date, yet we see these strong ligands throughout the water column. And so I just pulled out a few depths from one profile at Station Aloha, and what you can see is that there's in the surface and the deep chlorophyll max, there's this one kind of compound here, and then below the euphotic zone at 300 and 400 meters, there's this kind of suite of sideriformes that we saw and actually they're present in much higher concentrations than these other compounds where we thought we might see more. And in general in surface waters in Station Aloha we've seen these ferrioxamine type sideriformes, which I've shown here, and then these compounds that we tend to see below the euphotic zone are these amphibactin compounds and they're kind of different types of compounds where they have these long side chains and they can, as opposed to these ferrioxamines, these are tend to be sort of free floating in seawater, whereas these can partition into the cell membrane so the cell can kind of hold on to it. So this is kind of interesting as well. And so even though we've been seeing these strong ligands from voltammetry work below the euphotic zone, we were kind of interested if these compounds are being produced in situ or not, or what some of the mechanisms for the presence of the sterophores are below the euphotic zone. So we incubated some particles from these depths over just three days. And in our plus particle treatments, when we incubated them in the dark, we saw production of sideriformes in these compounds. So using this as some preliminary evidence that some part of the re remineralization process by um, particle associated bacteria, they're producing these sideriformes. So um, we thought that was encouraging. And when you calculate the rate that they're producing them, it's actually a pretty high rate. There's been some other work that's looked at just the remobilization of dissolved iron by bacteria from particles. And this rate is only a little bit less than the rate of um, iron production from particles by bacteria as well. So, and some other studies have also seen this and it's kind of a follow-up to one of this earlier work. So that was also really interesting. Okay, so just that was just summarizing a little bit of what we've seen at Station Aloha. So we're starting to see some interesting patterns. We've seen some seasonality in the sideriformes. There seems to be kind of like a depth zonation of different compounds, which could mean they have different functionalities or are produced by different bacteria. And for me, it was very interesting to see that sideriformes are produced in situ, perhaps below the euphotic zone. And so now I just want to focus on a couple of surface samples that I pull out along this transect just to show you some other interesting patterns that we've been seeing. So again, here's just one other surface sample from Station Aloha, not a ton going on there. And then as we moved up into this kind of transition zone between the oligotrophic gyre and the HNLC region, we start to see a few more compounds pop in. And then when we got up to the HNLC region, we saw the very high concentrations of sideriformes. And in fact, there was kind of some interesting patterns similar to what we saw at Station Aloha in a way where um, in most of our stations in the oligotrophic gyre, we saw predominantly these ferrioxamine sideriformes. And then once we got into the HNLC, we saw much more prevalence of these amphiphilic or amphibactin type compounds. And this was interesting because at Station Aloha where we saw these amphibactins, it was below the euphotic zone where there was kind of higher nitrate relative to iron, and that's almost analogous to the nutrient conditions up here. So we don't know exactly what the connection is yet, but some interesting patterns that we're starting to see. And so in general, if you just calculate the concentrations of these sideriformes that we saw in surface samples along the transect, they're almost, they're basically below our detection limit in some samples in the gyre. But as we get up into the subpolar region, in the higher nutrient, low iron waters, that's where we saw the highest concentrations and also the greatest diversity of compounds. So these colors just represent the different compounds that we saw and I just labeled them A through M for simplicity, but there's a much greater diversity of sideriformes in this area that we think is kind of iron limited. And so I've showed you some of these patterns, but really the thing that I wanted to get at is what portion of this L1 ligand pool do we think these compounds are. So this is a profile at Station Aloha where I use traditional kind of voltamic um, methods to measure the L1 ligand pool. So the profile looks like that. And you take 
one of our chromatograms from the ICPMS and you integrate under that iron curve and turn that into a concentration of iron binding organic ligands that we get in our solid phase extraction method, you get this profile here. And so if you'll notice the profiles look very similar, so that's very encouraging. But if you look at the scale, you can see that this is much lower. So we're obviously not getting all the organic iron binding compounds in our solid phase extraction step that we can measure with um, these other methods. And in fact, if you break this down even further to just the concentrations of siderophores, you get even lower concentrations. So the siderophores themselves represent less than 1% of the L1 ligand pool that we can measure with traditional methods at Station Aloha. So this was very interesting to me. So I wanted to think about this a little bit further. So we've seen some of these interesting patterns, but then they only represent about 1% of this L1 ligand pool. So, you know, what role are they really playing and why might an organism want to produce these compounds um, in the first place? So to get a little bit of an idea of that, we decided to make sort of a two ligand iron speciation model in the DCM, um, essentially at Station Aloha. And the way we did that is we have I, I wanted to kind of imagine the sort of maximum influence that the siderophores could have on iron speciation. So I took the highest concentration of siderophores that we measured in the deep chlorophyll max along that North Pacific transect, so that's 11 picomolar. And then I had isolated some representative siderophores in the lab from different cultures that match siderophores we're seeing in seawater, so the ferrioxamines as well as the amphibactins. And then I measured the strength of those compounds um, using voltammetry. And so this is the, the strongest one that I measured. So again, looking at kind of this maximum influence. And then I took the average ligand concentration that I measured with the voltammetry method, so just the L1 ligand concentration, as well as the average strength for those. So we use this to kind of make a two ligand model. Um, and so this is what you get over this kind of pretty narrow range of iron concentrations that are representative of what we're seeing in the DCM. And so the, the blue is inorganic iron concentration, the orange is iron bound to the siderophore, and then the green is iron bound to other ligands, so other L1 ligands. And so one thing to point out that we've, we've already kind of known, but I think it's nice to sort of see it visualized in this way, is that iron bound to the siderophores is two orders of magnitude higher than inorganic iron concentrations. So in terms of iron uptake, we generally think of inorganic iron as being the most bioavailable form of iron in seawater, even though we know it's essentially negligible because we basically know that almost all the um, dissolved iron in seawater is organically complexed. And so just the fact that iron is bound to siderophores is much higher than this inorganic iron could be one reason that um, an organism might produce them if that's the type of compound that they want to take up. But the other thing that's interesting, obviously, you would notice is that the iron bound to these other ligands is by far the largest majority of this whole iron pool. And it's much higher than the iron bound to siderophores or inorganic iron across all these concentrations. So I would argue that Siderophores are binding a significant amount of iron just due to how strong they are. And, you know, they're present in significant concentrations, but we want to know, are the, so, okay, they're there, but is our organisms actually interacting with that iron then and, and what's kind of going on? And so how does that influence their role in iron cycling? So to address this, now that we know what types of siderophores we're actually seeing in seawater, we isolated them from cultures in the lab, and then we labeled them with iron 55, or radioactive iron, so we could trace their uptake in seawater. So this is just, I, we've done several different experiments from different depths, but I'm just gonna show you one example from 15 meters. So we took 15 meter water at Station Aloha, so just with all the natural communities, and added these different siderophore treatments. This one is just an inorganic iron treatment, but I call it iron L because as soon as you spike in the inorganic iron 55, it associates with whatever natural organic compounds are there. And then we have this iron amphibactin treatment, 
ferrioxamine E and ferrioxamine B. And then we incubate it for 12 hours. And so if we look at the iron uptake over this time period, we see that the iron associated with just the natural organic matter in the seawater is the most bioavailable, so most of that was taken up. And then the amphibactins, iron associated with these compounds, also was relatively bioavailable, and then much less so for these ferrioxamine-type compounds. And this has kind of been seen before. There hasn't really been any work done with the amphibactins, but these types of ferrioxamines are used in culture studies um, quite often. And so just kind of these relative differences in bioavailability was interesting, um, but I was kind of wanted to take it one step further, and I, I want to know a little bit which organisms are actually taking up these compounds. And so we've done some supplemental kind of culture work as well. And so I took an iron-limited um, prochlorococcus culture, and I wanted to see if iron associated with sideriforms was available to this culture as well. And they had a similar kind of pattern of sideriform uptake. And so to just do a little bit of a thought experiment, if I estimate the total iron demand of prochlorococcus kind of at Station Aloha using some iron quotas that Nick Hocko determined as well as this iron 55 uptake data both from the culture experiment as well as in the field, we can get this kind of range for an estimated iron demand for prochlorococcus, which is about from 0.6 to 5 peak molar. And then if you calculate the concentrations of sideriforms at 15 meters where we did this calculation, they're 2.5 picomolar. So you could imagine that for some organisms, such as Prochlorococcus that I did this thought experiment for, um, they could be meeting all of their iron demand just through rapid cycling through just these sideriform compounds. And so one thing that I like to think about is Perhaps there are just specialist organisms that can interact with these different iron pools, um, such as you know the sideriform iron pool or the iron bound to these other ligands, even though they're a much vast majority, and that could be one way to kind of specialize if you're competing for this really scarce resource in seawater. And perhaps since there's kind of almost negligible amounts of inorganic iron, um, we don't exactly know what's going on with, with that pool in itself. And so, so in general, we're seeing um, sideriforms that are present throughout the water column that we've examined so far, which is just down to about 500, 600 meters. Um, with some experimental work, we've seen in situ production of sideriforms below the euphotic zone. Um, Sideriforms appear to represent about 1% of this L1 ligand pool, but we only really have a few profiles for this, so I think we really need to look at this further. And we know that we're not isolating all sideriforms from seawater just because of the solid phase extraction step that we do. Um, so we're likely missing some, but I don't, I, I'm sure that we're um, not missing a huge portion. So I think understanding what what else makes up this L1 ligand pool will be obviously really important for interpreting iron speciation. And so, in, and in general, when we think about the role that the sideriforms are playing in iron cycling, we see just from kind of modeling iron speciation that iron bound to sideriforms is much greater than the inorganic iron concentration. Um, the iron that's associated with sideriforms that we're actually observing in seawater can be taken up by organisms, so that's some evidence as to why they might be producing them. And they have different um, levels of bioavailability, so perhaps there's some organisms that can access iron associated with these ferrioxamines as opposed to amphibactins, et cetera. Um, and I think the interesting thought experiment is that it's possible to meet iron demand perhaps for some organisms just through rapid cycling of this pool. So if that is your strategy as an organism to produce these compounds and then take up that whole iron sideriform complex, that could be one competitive strategy that you have with your cell machinery that maybe some organisms um, don't have. So, um, and I didn't get to really talk about it today, but I just wanted to mention that we,
I just talked about siderophores, but we use these same methods for other metals. And so this is um, cobalt here, the y-axis, and then the retention time here on the x, and this is a depth profile. And so on all the samples that we run, we get data for multiple metals at once. So we're also interested in looking at these processes with cobalt binding ligands or copper binding ligands and um, other, other metals as well. Okay, and then um, just to sum up, I want to thank all my co-authors I had in the beginning. This is a very um, collaborative, interdisciplinary project. So there's been really gracious funding at HUI as well as Simons Foundation and NSF. And then we've started to kind of build up our um, sampling inventory now of, since we didn't really have a lot of samples for Siderophores and seawater. So I've been on several cruises especially the one that I showed today, which is this cruise here. And, um, and then sampling on a few other cruises were done by, these are uh, people in Seth John's lab at USC. And that's it.